is BBC... BBC Radio 1 Stories. Discover more. Hi, my name's Zane Lowe, and tonight I'm going to be taking you behind the label at one of the most influential and important music houses in modern music, Domino Records. an independent record label that doesn't have a musical criteria. It just tries to be a kind of vehicle for artists to realise their vision and their dreams and just basically tries to be a force for good really and just a force for kind of just to make interesting, beautiful things happen. It's like Mensa for higher functioning artists. The label to a small group of people in the world matters as its own thing. But then obviously all the bands that we release, those are the people that are actually sort of important that people know about and care about. Like very careful cooks who are a particularly nimbly fingered gardener. They kind of like give you a lot of time. They're delicate with their flowers, don't they? The humanist label really that allows people to fully express themselves. It's the way labels should be, really. Welcome to Radio One Stories, where this week we're looking at the people and key moments which has made Domino one of Britain's leading music institutions. You just heard from some of the artists and staff members from the label, such as Alexis Taylor from Hot Chip and Wild Beasts, who we'll catch up with again later. We'll also be asking the A&R department how they discover the next Mercury winning artist and chat to their digital team about how the label does more than just sell records in an increasingly turbulent music industry. But first, let's go to South West London and talk to some of the people who make Domino what it is and ask them what it's like to work there. Beginning with Lawrence Bell, label boss, who's come a long way since 1993, where it all began in his bedroom just down the road from where the current office is in Wandsworth. Hello there, I'm Lawrence Bell, the man behind Domino Records. We're lucky enough to kind of get quite a big space and we took the roof out and we have it all open plan. And I sit in the middle and everyone sits around. So we, which, you know, it's, it's a good vibe. We just try and make sure in the age of email and internet communication that we all talk with our mouths as much as possible and everybody can go over and talk to each other rather than having lots of small offices and people boxed up. It's, communication's a really important thing. I work across quite varied sort of genres of music, you know, I've got sort of singer-songwriters, folk singers, you know, kind of pop bands, you know, lesbian hip-hoppers. Hello, my name's Bart McDonough and I work for Domino. The sort of style of music is very different and also just, you know, the the role the role I have. and It's a very cool job to, <laughs> to have, you know, it you know, really allows me to work with really cool bands, you know, be creative and I think that's kind of priceless really. It's a place of kind of hard work. Everyone's very focused and it's quite, it's, it's a pretty sort of industrious place. I mean, I remember when I first came here, it was, yeah, I was quite taken aback really, firstly by about, you know, the amount of people that are here. All my other experiences with record labels have been on a much smaller scale and I came in and thought, well, this is a real kind of serious thing. But it's also very fun and, and friendly and I think that it's, it's a very like fertile, creative kind of environment. All the time that our artists are in town, they'll pop in and feel at ease just to hang around like Connor from Villages is in today and just hanging out. It's exciting. The Domino office is like, it's very homely. You come in and there's lots of hugs and, and they, uh, today they've got all the Villagers stuff on the, uh, on the screens and I can see them getting everything ready for the single. So it's kind of cool being here and, and seeing, seeing it all work and there's no kind of big boss up in an office that you don't see ever. Everyone's just in the same room and it just feels kind of feels nice. And later that day, the song the Domino Office was working on became my hottest record. Now, the hottest record in the world is from Villages, and this track is called The Waves. Stay with us, Connor. Yo, 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 this is exclusive business right here, man. Exclusive. The hottest world. world, world, world. world. Zane Lowe. 
Of these ridiculous demands No time for innocence Or sitting on the fence What are you gonna do? What are you gonna When the waves Cover the coastal plain The tents and the cars and the trains And the trains Of honeybee cemeteries Of well insulated Over the past two decades, Domino has worked with some of the most innovative and important British and American acts. But what is it that drives artists to Domino? Often barely old enough to legally buy a beer, men in suits start throwing contracts in front of your nose, offering vast sums of money you never thought really existed. And guess what? More often than not, they don't. But Domino artists, to a degree, see past all that. It's about the ethos of the label, what it represents, the music it's put out in the past, and also the man at the top, Lawrence Bell. As Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age told me when I interviewed him last year. Long ago, the first Queens record went out of print and I've been sort of waiting for the right moment where to re-release it. The reason for me even to go to Domino's from working with the Monkees. I mean, I mean, the way that the Monkees and Lawrence Bell, who runs Domino, that relationship that they had was bizarre to me. It was bizarre to hear Lawrence say, what, I just want them to be happy. I think they need to work a little more to be happy. And, and me going, I wish someone would say that to me, Dad. It was February 2007 when we signed. Wow. And Chris had a car accident the weekend after, oh, didn't he? It, yeah. He flipped his car and it was on his roof. And that was a kind of symbolic, <laughs> OK, maybe there was something in this. Hi, I'm Hayden from Wild Beasts. And this is Tom. I think he sees us as like nephews in some way. We definitely felt like he has a close eye on us because he's kind of seen us through you know, three albums now and we're about to start working a fourth. I think as 21-year-olds, if we had have had a deep insight into what labels were, we wouldn't have been making the music we were making. You know, we are concentrated entirely on this idealism that if we wrote the right songs, then the right things would happen. Yeah. And, and they did, but equally there are other like-minded bands at that age who fall into the wrong hands and get the wrong advice. And, mm. What happened to us was we met Lawrence and, and we had a really humane conversation about creativity and what, what drove us. And at that point, they sent us to Sweden. We were never told what to do. And I think, in retrospect, for a label with Domino's creative prestige to put your entire faith in a bunch of 20, 20 run year olds who are going off a promise, mm. then I think that's, you know, there's a huge amount of balls in there. Guinness. I got a phone call when I was in Liverpool and I hadn't really heard of them to be honest. I didn't really know about labels and all that stuff. I was I was aware of the fairies really. I would just come back from like buying some food or something in the shops and I was unpacking while I was on the phone in the kitchen in Liverpool and they said have you heard of us? And I was like no nah. but I was like but well, you've got my ear. I was like it's a label. I'm getting all excited. I'd bought the second Franz Ferdinand album that day in Liverpool and I took it out of the bag and I was like, oh, wait, I have heard of you. Like, I've heard of you quite recently, as in this second. And then I looked at my CD collection and I realised I had half their repertoire. Yeah, I had heard of them in a way.
Back in 1993, things were very different. Obsessed by music from a very young age, Lawrence had moved to London from Ipswich, working in a record shop before he began scouting artists for Fire Records. But he had an idea for a label with a specific ethos and also wanted to release music which people weren't necessarily aware of in the UK. So he took a punt and set up Domino. There wasn't much going. There was just me then. There was just that was just like a basement flat and a bed in one corner. I didn't even have a desk actually. I just had a phone and a fax machine, and I sort of sat cross-legged on the floor and uh, a load of stamps and packages, just you know, ringing people up, hassling them, telling me how good the records we were putting out were, putting them in packages and sending them to people, and then ringing them up saying, "Have you listened to it? Check it out." All on the phone, you know. So, so it's maybe a bit less time on the phone these days than there used to be, which. I sort of miss actually. Then after six months, we got an office just about 50 yards up the road, and that was great. Yeah, we, we the first thing I bought was a jukebox, and it, then it broke down after about one day. And I had a desk, and I got my my first part-time employee. Lou Barlow started Sabado, and and just the the songs were just lyrically and musically were were you know just really connected with me. The main song was called Soul and Fire. And it was a yeah, really, really beautiful sort of heartbreaking kind of ballad. I heard a demo tape with that song on it, and that was when I realised how special they were and how special a songwriter Lou was. And that became the first single on Domino and the, the lead song on the first album on Domino, which was Sabado's Bubble and Scrape. I was working at another record label and Lawrence had just started Domino and Will Oldham actually left the label I was working with after one record and moved to Domino and that's how we came together. Hi, my name's Jackie Rice, I work at Domino Records. I always describe my role as Minister of Art Portfolio because I don't have a particular office but I just get involved in supporting creativity by whichever means necessary. So it's a very fluid role. I get behind any creative project that needs doing, basically. Lawrence is a great visionary and I say we work so well together because I'm a great doer. And because obviously you can have great ideas, but you've got to be able to make them happen. It's a way of life because Lawrence and I are together. So there's a real overlap between private life and the work. Well, it's a complete overlap. He's never brought anything home and played it. And it's not made me go, wow, we've got to do that. Nor the visage I held up to support me in life's cure Oh Lord, can you be in me? Jackie has been working with Lawrence since the very early days of Domino, when the label was licensing music rather than putting it out. Meaning, they wouldn't make the records and master them, but be an outlet for British fans to hear the latest American bands. They'd buy the rights to the tracks and sell them in the UK, so fans didn't have to buy expensive imports from the United States. These were the days before YouTube and SoundCloud. It was a combination, really. I couldn't really afford to, to make records, to be honest. It was a very, you know, there was a lot of money going about in the 90s, although I didn't have any of it. The British music scene was wrapped up with, you know, the, the major labels were were signing anything that moved and there was a lot of labels with money. So I just found with licensing records, it was a small amount, you just pay in advance. Because you weren't paying for the record to be made, you were just, you know, advancing some money for the rights to the record in Europe. You know, I was able to start without having much capital, you know, and he started the company with a, a few quid and managed to just grow from that really. So it was uh, practical as much as anything. But yeah, I was a little, I wasn't too excited around the time of Britpop and there were some things I liked. I didn't find it that that interesting. It was a bit sort of self-congratulatory or something, you know. So what's the matter with you? Sing me something new. Now you know I'm ready. 
it, it, it just really grew just as the records grew and we you know one band would lead to another and you know we put out three records and then 10 records and 20 records and a small catalogue would build up. A few little moments when certain records did well. Bands like Royal Trucks were really important to us. They did an album called Accelerator. You know, any of Will Oldham's records as Palace, Palace Brothers, Palace Music, and the Smog albums he made in the 90s were massive for us. There was quasi Elliot Smith, Either Or. When we signed Pavement in the middle of the 90s, that was a that was a big moment for us because they were already quite a big band and they'd made a couple of albums already. Spent a lot of time learning how to do things well and we were always very honest and we, we treated the bands well and we paid them on time and we were very passionate, you know, we worked really, really hard and, and we were fun people maybe to be with as well. Pavement and their iconic frontman Stephen Malkmus had been making records for a couple of years when Domino signed them. It was a pivotal moment in the label's history as the band were already big and it showed Lawrence meant serious business. Richard King was one of the team who left the UK to try and broker the deal as one of his first jobs for Lawrence. It began a 17-year association with Domino, during which time he's also written books on music, such as How Soon Is Now, The Mad Men and Mavericks Who Made Independent Music, 1975 to 2005. We'd flown to LA to try and persuade Pavement to sign to Domino. It's myself, Lawrence and Jackie. Neither Jackie or me actually worked for Domino at that point, but we flew to LA as the representatives of Domino. So we were in a hotel in uh, off Sunset Strip, and I remember having this drunken conversation with Stephen Maltmus about the second Incredible String Band album. I don't think that's what helped them sign to Domino at all, but is the kind of conversation I'd, I'd learned from Lawrence at talking to bands about music is really all bands want to talk about. It was a really bold move. Domino was sort of slightly punching above its weight signing a band like that. And it was a time when Britpop and British music was really, really popular. And no one really was paying much attention to American music. There'd be a few people in the media and John Peel who'd pay any attention and a handful of promoters in the UK and Europe. And that was it. No one else cared at all. Lawrence spent a lot of that Britpop period being in America where everyone else, all eyes were focused on Camden. And it felt that if we could get pavement, it would be a brilliant time in the kind of dying embers, horrible kind of ashtray of Britpop and Camden at that time to come back with a band that was just so much more interesting, that didn't talk about careers and formats, but just had all this style and this musical talent that was kind of, you know, all these Britpop bands, the second or third albums, you really weren't hearing much excitement. And then Pavement came back with Bright in the Corners. Terrifically exciting record. And the next thing you know, you get Damon Albarn and Justine Frischman turning up at the shows, and Pavement always be, almost became kind of exit strategy for Britpop bands to hang around them to hope some of that wayward and wild talent would rub off. Blind date with the Chancellor, we had oysters and dry lancers, and the check when it arrived, we went Dutch, 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 a redder shade of neck on a whiter shade of trash, and this emery boy is giving me a rash. I'm flat out, you're so beautiful to look at when you cry. Freeze, don't move.
from a bedroom in Putney, Domino had grown into a label which was pioneering music to challenge Britpop and inspire the likes of Damon Orban and Future Blur Records. But how do they go about choosing the artists they want to sign? Let's go back to the Domino office and ask Jack Shankly, who works in A&R, the department of the label which scouts out new acts and chooses who to sign, how he finds the next wild beasts or arctic monkeys. When it comes to bringing new artists into the company or, or looking for new music, it's quite sort of informal or maybe like fluid or something in a way. I work closely with Lawrence in that respect and also our A&R people in the, in the United States. We don't really have anything too regular really. I think it's just more of a case of I'm constantly searching and very much in maybe quite a modern way, like quite internet-y, geeky, because that's the sort of background I have. I'll be just finding things all the time, just emailing it to Lawrence or to a chap called Morgan in the, in the States and a lady called Susan and Chris who runs our office there. And just kind of this constant conversation that you can have really often. I'll email something and they'll say, well, I've just about to email you the same thing, you know, and then and that's when you maybe know that it's going to be a good thing, a good thing for the company when a couple of you kind of accidentally are starting to, to talk about it. Also, I, I guess other kind of people in the industry, so, you know, tipping you off and we'll just, in a more traditional way or something, and getting out and seeing a load of shows, we still do that kind of stuff. It's just a case of, I'll just, well, personally, I'll just find something or hear about something and then become more and more obsessed over the course of weeks and then they have been nagging people, really. You know, have you listened to that yet? Have you listened to that yet? And then... Maybe Lawrence will be like, yeah, I did actually at the weekend, it was fantastic. And then we'll try and talk to the artist a little bit more and think about the actual possibility of doing something. The excitement, I think, for me is as much about the character and the, and the person of this artist that you've kind of like stumbled upon or been introduced to. And you kind of get like a window into their kind of imagination and often extremely cool people. Yeah, and he kind of just gets his own momentum. You just kind of think, oh, the more you listen to the record, the more you talk to them, the more you're just very keen to sort of cement this relationship and be able to help them. And, there's not really any science to it, it's a lot more kind of passion or emotion. <laughs> it's a bit of a trip, you know. You're listening to Radio One Stories, behind the label at Domino Records. We don't really have anything sort of formal. We'll get together and I'll, I'll talk to people who find music for us and people within the company. I just like talking about music and hearing it. Try and keep it just sort of natural and like, like you would if your friends were around your house or something. And say, oh, you got, I've got something I want to play you, you know. If you're really excited about something, please tell me about it, but, and I'll do the same. I like that feeling when I when I want to keep playing a song and over and over and again. I, I want to play it to everyone I I see. Oh, come and listen to this! I've got this, found this thing or heard this thing, and it's it's so good. So that that feeling when I want to talk and tell people about music, I always think that's the that's the best feeling about music. If you could bottle that feeling and sell it, then you know you'd be you'd be rich for sure. Over the years, Domino has indeed managed to sign some very talented artists. And there's been the odd occasion where they don't just utilise a future world-famous pop star's abilities to make records. Probably, I think it was 2002. Hi, it's Alexis here from Hot Chip. What I did there really was, I did a lot of the writing of everything that goes onto the website and writing all the press releases for records mail order stuff like just doing Domino Mart which was kind of made sense to me because I'd bought records from Domino that they'd posted to me via Domino Mart and now I was the person sending them out to other people. He was recommended to me by Kieran Hebden, Fortet and said that he was he was around, he was looking for a job and he was totally into the records we put out. I loved his taste, he had really really sophisticated musical taste for someone who was very young and I was always interested in what he was listening to and he was, we were into similar types of music so we just talked about music a lot. I also remember I, for a while I had to listen to demos and I found the Hot Chip demo that I'd sent in a few years before that hadn't been opened yet. I was just in my office down the road from here. The manager came over and I knew him a little bit and said, oh, I've heard this band from Glasgow, you know, and I've got this tape of a couple of songs. Do you want to hear it? He said, oh, there are these guys, they're not really playing on the normal scenes. They're living in a warehouse and having these parties where all the art school kids are going and just outside of the scene and painted quite a sort of fascinating little picture of them operating on their own. In their own world and their own terms and they played the song and it was two songs actually and they were, they were really they just had a great energy about them one of them was teller tonight and one of them was darts of pleasure 
sort of poppy, but they're scratchy and, you know, there was a sort of, sort of kind of wink in its eye, you know, and it had something about it. There's something going on. It was different, it sounded fresh. Franz Ferdinand demos were were in I remember because I shared an office space with Lawrence himself so just me and him in a room so I'd listen to everything that he was checking out those early demos were pretty rough and really exciting sounding and I just kind of watched their first well, maybe it was their second show at the Africa Centre in Covent Garden and watched the way that the label was changing as they were signing a band that to be honest they hadn't really signed a band on that scale before hadn't really had to put that much money into signing a band so it was a strange time to be at the label you know it was kind of everything was going into trying to make that record work and and it did massively i wrote the press release for that franz record and yeah just felt felt involved in in that time and i remember saying to lawrence darts of pleasure really needs to be on a 12 inch it can't just be like a cd and a seven inch and he kind of agreed, even though they weren't thinking of doing that originally, but I felt like it just had such a connection to big 12-inch singles from, from the early 80s. It just felt, felt like that was the right format. You are the latest adventure. My name's Richard King, you're listening to Behind the Labels with Domino Records. I was in there visiting and Lawrence played me the demo. Still, this is early 20th century, Domino had a terrible stereo. You know, there's no professional stereo or anything, it's still a portable CD player with a tape deck. And uh, he put the Franz demo in and didn't do it very often, but he played it so the whole office could hear it as though, you know, this is a, everyone pay attention kind of thing just one of those things you read about and you dream about no one quite knows how it happens but just some there is a connection made and suddenly it's a name you hear everywhere and this is before the record comes out and if people understood why that happens it would happen a lot more often but there is just a magical thing about a band the right time with the right label i went to see them first in london and i was blown away that were extraordinary to watch they just looked like a gang that you wanted you sort of wanted to go to their party sort of thing they, they looked amazing the guitarist was wearing a cape and the drummer was dressed in a sailor's outfit and they were just playing these great songs they had a lot of charisma then I went up to Glasgow and saw them a couple of times up at the art school and saw the scene that was going on around them you know all these all these great looking girls dancing and you know kind of weird people you know around them and it was you know you're just like whoa yeah this is <laughs> I definitely want to go to these hang around the scene. <laughs> Hi, this is Alex Capranos from Franz Ferdinand. I had a lot of friends who, who had been to the art school or were still at the art school. There were a lot of people putting on parties that were so artists putting on their work or showing off their work and bands like us playing things as well. We definitely sort of felt that we wanted to be outside the regular kind of gigging scene that you get in towns. We wanted to go out and do things ourselves, so we found buildings that weren't really being used and, and we put on our own parties and uh, they were usually complete chaos because you know, organisation isn't really our strength as a band but they ended up being like sort of a pretty wonderful form of chaos. Some of them were in a, an old warehouse that we called the Chateau, six storeys high I think, in a part of Glasgow which is notorious for arson or alleged arson. So this guy couldn't rent out his place so we sort of kind of squatted it and used to put on parties there. It was just a, you know, a good scene, like a, a, lot, a lot of good people kicking around, a lot of really creative people, but most of all it was a good social scene. Everybody got on with each other, that's how you get the best ideas, isn't it? Sitting around with your pals and having a drink. I think they wanted to be on an independent label and they, they, they were from that culture, they'd grown up in that culture, so we were lucky and we had a good connection when we talked the way they wanted to do things you know, was similar to how we did things, and but we still, we still wanted to, we wanted them to be on top of the pops, and I think they wanted to be part of the heritage of independent music in this country, which is so rich, and they recognised that Domino was a part of that on the label side, and they wanted to be one of the bands. So if you
Alright, uh, Alexis and Joe did a remix of Take Me Out. It was an unofficial remix because Alexis was in the office so he could get his hands on the parts. And I think it was when they were just kind of like getting their head around the sort of like the remixing thing. So I remember the first remix we got back, it wasn't quite in time. And then they did something later on which really worked out. A couple of months ago I was in the studio with Joe and Alexis and Joe was saying, oh yeah, we took the took the kick drum from Take Me Out and used it <laughs> several times. And apparently, well this is what Joe was saying, it's the, it's the kick drum in Over and Over, it's actually the same kick drum that's in Take Me Out, so... The first time I ever heard Franz Ferdinand, I along with many, many other people realised that this would be a turning point not only for British music, but for the label that was releasing it. For a label like Domino that had been patiently licensing and releasing records of great taste and great merit for so many years, this felt like the necessary tipping point to put it in the room along with the other great independent record labels that had already experienced mainstream success. Franz Ferdinand with the perfect band to do it. Their self-titled debut album went to number three in the UK charts, sold 3.6 million copies by the end of 2004, contained three top 10 singles, and bagged them Brit Awards, an Ivan Avello Award, and the coveted Mercury Music Prize. These Glaswegian boys had elevated Domino to the top table of the British music industry, and they were the turning point which would see Domino enjoy a purple patch in the noughties. With particular thanks to one Sheffield band, they also gave Domino Records a crucial business card that they could hand out to other bands and encourage them to trust Domino to release their music. But even with all of this, it doesn't mean they were, or even are today, able to get every band they want on their books. I think it's uh, definitely a part of an A&R person's job is that you have to sort of take the rough with the smooth and roll with the punches a bit. You know, it's very competitive. There are lots of other wonderful labels who are all vying to work with the best new artists as well. Some get away and then you know you can't go to their show and you can't listen to their record and you can't bear to watch the new video or whatever for a while but then you just find some someone else or another band or another solo artist it's just any form of heartbreak I think <laughs> I think the analogy with like an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend in, in that respect is quite a accurate ignore them in the in the street for a bit and then <laughs> six months down the line you'd be drunk at a festival and you can watch them and enjoy it just as you would in the first place <laughs> hi my name's Jackie Rice I work at Domino Records I think at the time that Bell and Sebastian first came out there was a desire to sign them well obviously hot chip alexis taylor he worked at domino running the mart we desperately wanted to sign them and it was painful so painful and lawrence hates losing any band but how wonderful look at you know they're on the, the label now and they've released a sort of career best record Say it now. Lawrence, I remember saying to me that he just, you know, left us to it because we seemed to have our thing going with Moshi Moshi and DFA. And then at some point I kind of said, we'd, you know, we'd like to be with Domino. And yeah, they tried to sign us and it didn't work out for various reasons. But I was sort of really busy and I wasn't paying much attention. I knew he had the band and I'd heard a couple of songs and it was, you know, it's groovy and a funky little thing he had going on, but I didn't get around to going to see them until it was maybe too late almost. I saw them in Iceland and the, all the Icelandic kids were all going nuts and I was like, holy cow, you know, Alexis's band is blowing up in Iceland. Unfortunately, I was too late by then because all the, all the other labels were onto them and went off and signed to EMI. But the new record they've made is as good as anything they've done and, you know, we're so excited working on that record this year. It's been a great campaign and, you know, they're, they're just one of the, the great contemporary British pop groups. I was really upset when we didn't sign them the first time because I realised I made a mistake and that they were sort of like a, a perfect domino band. And they were even from around here. They were from, like, they lived about a mile from the office. I wish we'd worked with them all along, you know. Then I would have been able to put out over and over and the boy from school and ready for the floor and all those fantastic singles that they made. And then 
remember Lawrence saying to me, after we failed to get you, uh, he was in a bidding war with EMI for the Arctic Monkeys. It was like, I'm just, I have to get them. Like, after not getting Hot Chip, there's no way I'm not going to get this band, the Arctic Monkeys. So just put everything into that, which was really nice, you know, that he felt, felt that strongly about it. Anticipation has a habit to set you up for disappointment in evening entertainment, but tonight there'll be some love. Tonight there'll be a rookie share, regardless of what's gone before. I want to see all of the things that we've already seen. The Larry girls are out the window of the limousine. Of course, it's fancy dress. And they're all looking quite for all in funny ears and devil eyes and I was very late. To know about Arctic Monkeys, I wasn't really paying attention. I'm not really, I'm not sure if I'm a very good, uh, you know, A&R guy. I'm, I'm always so busy that it's hard to get my attention. I think it must have been after about four people had sort of bashed me over the head with a saucepan and said, Lawrence, you really got to listen to Arctic Monkeys. I know you're going to love them. Took it home and had a listen to them. And I freaked out immediately and I realised how great they were. And then I started sort of ringing up the managers and just saying, Hey, can we talk? Is it too late? You know, and they were like, well, it is too late, really. We've met all these labels and we're tired of talking to labels and the, the band are tired of talking to labels. They don't really want to have any more conversations. But eventually I, I, they did let us have a conversation. And again, we, we got on well and I couldn't believe it when they agreed to sign to us. I was in the office and a couple of people working there having a conversation. One of them just put the phone down and said, um, that's my friend X who works at Major Label Y. And he's ringing to say, the fact that Arctic Monkeys have signed to Domino has sent shockwaves around the West End music industry. No one can believe this band has signed with Domino. And that was a very good feeling, I think. <laughs> Nationwide Mercury Prize is Arctic Monkeys! For their album, whatever people say I am, that's what I am not! Oh, don't forget, there's a check. Oh, yeah, I'll take Somebody call 999, Richard Hall has been robbed. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. No, because normally, I'm, uh, you know, I don't go to a, a band that's, I suppose, sold as many records as we have. <laughs> like, but, to put it bluntly, but, like, you know, but still, you know, we're very, very pleased with it, because it's just, like... Good talent. Good, yeah, good tunes, really. That's, like, what, what I think we like, try to do. A bunch of boys from Sheffield had taken the music industry by storm. But how and why were they able to completely and utterly wipe the floor of everything in their sight? Yeah, I wasn't really surprised because the talent was yeah, just just unbelievable, you know, to, to me. Four people so young who were so sort of fully formed and so almost like a perfect British rock and roll band. I'm, a, I'm as much of a fan as anyone else. I was 16 and really pretty excited. Hi, I'm Nora Snapes. I'm associate editor of Pitchfork and you're listening to Radio On Stories Behind the Label with Domino Records. I think that Arctic Monkeys became successful, it's a really obvious point to make, but because the songs were just brilliant, around that time there was a lot of talk of kind of the whole landfill indie thing, and I think that the, the subjects that Arctic Monkeys were covering in their songs that Alex Turner was writing lyrics about, they weren't a million miles away from what was going on in that kind of very humdrum, everyman situation, but it was just conveyed in so much sharper, wittier terms than normal. I'm originally from Cornwall and situations that Alex Turner was singing about, parochial indie discos and the weirdos that you'd see on night out, it very much chimed with the non-London centric kind of lifestyle that I had around that age. It felt really exciting that something that hadn't had a great deal of kind of media pimping, I guess, had gone to number one. I think it was the first time in my experience of being a big indie music fan that a song that I'd really genuinely loved had gone straight to number one. It felt amazing. The Arctic Monkeys, talking back in 2006. 
No, I don't. It never really occurred to us that we'd be successful. I don't think. Certainly not like on this to this extent because it has really gone a bit a bit silly, hasn't it? Because all then all there is to talk about now, we it kind of it ceases to be about sort of what tunes you've done or what you're writing or anything. It's all just like so you're this phenomenon then, aren't right? And that's all every everyone wants to know. The subjects of the Arts Monkey songs, they were very relatable and they were conveyed in a really inviting, kind of unusual style. I know that Alex Turner was a big fan of Roots Maneuver when he was a teenager and although you can't really hear that much of a hip-hop influence on Arctic Monkey's lyrics, you can definitely see that he's taken a lot of the really quick-fire wordplay delivery from that style of music. Witness the fitness, the comfort to live at. one hope, one quest. I kind of like, we're into a lot of hip hop and stuff at school, especially, and then like kind of got more out of it and more into like indie and stuff like that, but still kept like the hip hop with me and stuff like that. I mean, like, oh, it's, and I think there might have been, there might be a bit of that influence there. It's kind of get a few words, a few more syllables and all that and stuff. There's all that kind of vibe. Yeah, we used to be tight, me and my naughty friends, cause Pierre Magnus in the ends. I mean, day and night, we rub, we smoke, we love to fight, smoking, drinking, drag ragging, drugs, fuck. There's a definite kind of a rhythm to it, a rhythm aspect. I mean, some some of our stuff we might start off by being inspired by like a drum beat or something like that. Because you know, you kind of people normally say, oh, "Yeah, I've got the, like the chords or the lyric or whatever." But sometimes it might be real, like like Matt and I might get together and it'll be like, "Oh, well, we're gonna do this and really like work on a beat and kind of look at that side of things." And that's kind of a that's like I suppose a different kind of way to look at it. With popularity comes awards and things, but I don't think Arctic the Monkeys themselves have ever cared too much about that kind of thing, which is quite refreshing. Although, while well, the modern incarnation of Arctic Monkeys might be a little bit more besotted by fame than they once were, you know, in their earlier stages, it was really nice to see that they they weren't really into that. They were still the young guys from Sheffield that they were when they started out. The combination of them and the Libertines a few years before them, they were the kind of bands that could really make you obsessive for the first time, particularly about completism, because before anything official had come out, there was loads available on the kind of burgeoning download scene on the internet. And so you could either, you know, download some bootleggers off Napster, or I used to buy, I wasn't allowed to use Napster and our internet connection wasn't strong enough to handle it. So I would buy CDRs off eBay full of demos. And I think they were really great bands for kind of engendering a brand new generation of independent music fans who were really obsessive and really wanted to own everything and really cared about the band. In an interview like this, there was like a French journalist and they were banging on and on and on about why we've done it, what we've done or whatever and I'm like, mate, we didn't read enough books and we didn't listen to enough music, that's probably why we're so good. But there's loads of things, because I'm not, I'm not one of like kind of create any illusions that we we, we know a great deal because we've still got a lot to learn like about everything, but also like about music. You know, there's plenty of things we don't we haven't discovered yet. Since the Arctic Monkeys' groundbreaking debut record, whatever people say I am, that's what I'm not. Alex Turner and the boys have gone on to release three more critically acclaimed albums, all on Domino, and each showing a different musical side and progression to the Sheffield band. Creativity and willingness to experiment is not unique to the Monkees, but reflects Domino as a whole, with acts as varied as Anna Calvi to the Count and Sinden, and Lawrence ensuring his passion of American music is still obvious, with signings like Animal Collective and Dirty Projectors. 
Delivery of awards to the Southwest London office became a regular thing, which is all well and good, but fundamentally, a label is about selling records, and it's this which keeps it alive. The music industry over the past few years has had a very difficult time, with sales plummeting. In August, Rihanna topped the UK album chart, selling just 9,500 copies of her album, the lowest figure ever to reach this illustrious position. And indies, in particular, always have to find ways to keep their music fresh and exciting, to draw music fans to them. The main problem that independent record labels are facing, obviously, is downloading because they produce records in smaller quantities and so it costs them more and they need, obviously they need people to buy their records to actually stay afloat. And it's very rare that, you know, in examples of a record like XL, they'll have an album like Adele's Records, which are kind of pretty much bankrolling the whole thing so they don't have to worry about it too much. And with Domino, I, am at, I think it might have been Wild Beast once indirectly thanked Arctic Monkeys for existing because it meant that Domino could continue to sign bands like them. I think now all bets are off. It's a really strange time to be in the recording music industry. Nobody knows where it's going. So just try and come up with ideas and innovate. And I, I get the sense that they know that a record label should be a little bit more than just something which sells units. You know, it should be something that's a little bit of a creative hub for artists and stuff. And, and you can sense that, you know. This is Domino Radio live from Wandsworth. And we're swinging. Domino Radio, for one week only in 2011, though hopefully we're coming back. We'd been talking for a while about let's we should do a radio station. And then one day we did, with the, the objective being let's just have some create some good vibes. We thought let's go 24-7, see if we can fill all those hours, which we did. And invited all our musical friends, some of our artists, other artists we love and admire and said, so come along and, you know, make a show. You can do whatever you want. We'll just support that creativity. And that's what we did. We built a room upstairs, stuck an aerial out of the window. It was great to have so many of our artists participate, to sort of see them represent themselves in a very different way. And just, you know, when you're a kid growing up, you get into music through your artists. If one, someone you read about in The Enemy says, oh, we love this record, you seek it out, and that's how you navigate your way through this huge musical landscape. And so it's so exciting, as still being a fan of all the bands on the label, to see the records that excite them and to sort of go on another journey with them. Domino Radio, here in heaven, playing for the next couple of hours. The uh, sounds of uh, Mother Mallard's portable masterpiece, Earthquake Records, 1973. Brian Welts, aka Geologist from Animal Collective. We came up with the Animal Collective radio idea mainly because of, of well, two things. One was that the record that we were working on, even though we hadn't recorded it yet, we knew there were going to be these themes of radio um, in terms of sound design, like the idea of radio transmissions going into space. And we thought that it would be a cool idea to make our own mixes and our own radio shows online. And the thing that gave us the inspiration for that or what you know, let us know that it was possible was Domino had uh, done a project called Domino Radio and they asked Animal Collective to do a show. So I, I did a show for them and uh, you know, we just thought it was a really great idea. You know, There was really no conventional reason for them to do it and, and you know from a business standpoint we just thought it was you know really cool really creative it made us feel good about being on domino you know like here's a label that's not just in the business of selling records they're also in the business of you know doing something creative for themselves we as friends we used to make mixtapes for each other all the time we still to this day we have like a little email group with a bunch of friends and various bands where we send YouTube clips or songs to each other that we like. And certain bands that are big influences on us that at a certain time we thought anybody who's into underground music would just know these things. You know, recently the more conversations we've had with fans that we've met, you know, particularly the younger ones, we realized that they don't know these bands and that we were sort of a gateway for them to get into older underground and experimental music. And, and I think we've really enjoyed that interaction with our fans. So we thought that sending up a, a radio station, you know, would just be sort of a fun way for us to share things with them. The most recent thing that we've worked on digitally that I thought has been been going really well is Animal Collective Radio. I'm Kurt Lane, I'm head of digital at Domino. 
they came up with the idea of doing a series of a couple hour shows the one that was led by by each each of the members and then on the fourth one they would they would then also premiere the album for the first time so instead of going with an outside media partner to premiere that stream they would just do it all themselves and i think that that's that's a pretty powerful thing and i think a band that has a fan base like animal collectives you know they can really do that their fans like want to go directly to the band they want to be knowing sort of like what they're into what they're listening to they want to know what the larger sort of like cultural message is and like musical aesthetic is and i think it shows the power of an artist or a label to be the broadcaster in that case next year domino will celebrate its 20th anniversary and it's been a pretty incredible journey from lawrence bell's bedroom to holding some of the aces of british music in their hand They shunned Britpop and instead looked to America for their music in the 90s and have even set up their own radio station. But problems persist. It's difficult to break bands and sell records. It's hard to keep artists when major labels can throw much more money at them. But as Richard King says, Domino do have a chance of surviving not only next year, but for another 20 years to come. The music industry problems and independent labels problems are similar in one way in that it's very hard to sell music. Having said that, you know, Adele was an independent label, biggest selling record, possibly by the time we're talking now of all time, I don't know. It's important to remember that independent labels are very good at adapting quickly. They're very good at adapting to technology. They're very good at adapting to the market, for want of a better word, what people like. XL could sign Badly Drawn Boy and everyone goes, whoa, where's that coming from? And people just think, oh, that's what these people do. They take these creative decisions and see what happens. You can't really do that at Major because Majors are about hits. That's fine. Nothing against hits at all. Hits are great. Hits are especially great when independents have them by accident because suddenly, <laughs> suddenly they make some money, you know, which isn't something they know too much about. Indy's job is to find the bands and the acts and the, and the writers who are going to have a relationship with people who are really into music. And if you make that work, you can get by and you can thrive, and it's a great time for music. But you can't sign a band and think by third quarter next year we'll have sold X thousand and they'll be on, you know, two from the top of the stage at Reading. I mean, lots of people try and do that, but I don't think that's a successful way of looking at the problems that are facing the music business in its future. Franz Ferdinand's lead singer, Alex Kapranos. Of course, it's highly likely that, because nobody wants to pay for music anymore, that um, great labels like Domino or Rough Trade or XL or Warp or whoever, they're, they're going to collapse because you can't keep a company running if no money comes in. Maybe I'm being a cynic, or maybe I'm being a realist and say that you know, it's, there's, there's a lifetime there. But while that life's, while that heartbeat's still beating, I definitely want to be with Domino. It's the same as, as the band. You're there because you like each other and you get on with each other and chemistry is better than you'd find elsewhere. You feed off each other and make better things together. Uh, that's how I feel about Domino. I'm so proud of
absolutely love Domino. Big thanks to Zane and big thanks to Radio 1 Stories for the last hour on BBC Radio 1. 